Greetings and welcome to Categorical Imperatives. I am Lockheed and Liberal. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with the show, uh, welcome. This is a podcast where we will be using legal and moral philosophy to discuss current events as it relates to various aspects of politics and culture. And today we have the latest installment in a new series I've started doing. I'm actually kind of really enjoying uh, that I am calling Today in Supreme Court History. I am calling it that because it was on this day in 1905 uh, that one of the most important cases in the Supreme Court's history was argued, uh, and this is a case uh, that is known as Lochner v. New York. Uh, now, this is a case which is often considered uh, somewhat anti-canonical uh, in constitutional law, which is why, for example, in 2005, uh, when then-Senator Barack Obama was speaking out against a conservative California Supreme Court justice uh, named Janice Roger Brown's nomination to the prestigious U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, the junior senator from Illinois selected one of the most damning epithets in the liberal legal arsenal, Lochnerian. He said, quote, one of the things that is most troubling is Justice Brown's approval of the Lochner era of the Supreme Court. And uh, he continued to intone from the Senate floor that we need to keep in mind that the same judicial philosophy was the underpinning of the Dred Scott decision. I'm sure we are all very familiar with the notorious 1857 decision in Dred Scott, which declared that a black man has no rights which a white man is bound to respect. Now, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Lochner may be controversial, but it is not remotely similar to Dred Scott. Uh, it's actually a fairly uh, straightforward decision based on uh, several long-standing American principles, uh, foremost among them being uh, the free labor philosophy that was actually uh, central to the anti-slavery movement and a belief that there is a limit to which the government has the power to regulate the economy. Now, initially, when the decision was handed down in 1905, it had been very well received. Uh, it was only a few years later that it became a common rallying cry uh, among the burgeoning progressive movement in the country uh, that would eventually lead to the canonical view of this case uh, ever since at least FDR's New Deal uh, and the way that that has reshaped our entire country, uh, which really uh, in a lot of ways re revolved around rejecting uh, certain founding values of American republicanism. Uh, these are things like a belief in limited government, uh, natural rights, individual liberty, and uh, eventually turning into something of a fundamentally uh, democratic view of, of the country uh, in which the will of the majority should always be the first and foremost value. Now, in recent years, Lochner has uh, been rediscovered and to a certain degree rehabilitated among a growing movement of legal scholars, uh, generally those whose philosophy is rooted in constitutional originalism. But most liberal legal scholars today uh, will still tell you that Obama got it right and that Lochner represents a disgraceful triumph of evil bosses over their cruelly exploited workers, uh, reflecting a willingness to consistently side with the powerful over the powerless. And if you are maybe wondering what this case has to do with current events surrounding politics and culture, as the tagline of my show here suggests, uh, Lochner and its eventual rejection uh, still shape the way uh, laws are being created and designed to this very day. And I think the uh, best example of this uh, that I can come up with is something that many people are probably at least vaguely familiar with, known as AB5. Uh, and this is a recent bill 
that was signed into law in California, uh, and it is the one that regulates the gig economy out of existence. Uh, for example, uh, it essentially uh, prohibits uh, freelance journalists in California from being able to publish more than 35 articles a year and just generally has made the ability to privately contract as a freelance worker in this gig economy uh, virtually impossible. So this is, uh, for example, you're going to kill companies like Uber and Lyft in California. Uh, and while I'm sure this bill was passed with the best of intentions, it's becoming very evident that it is harming the very people that it was purported to help. Uh, and it is not just, it, it, it. California is really something of the test case for this because there are now serious discussions uh, about doing something very similar in uh, a few other states, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, New York are all talking about it. And there has even been some discussion uh, of implementing this nationwide. So with that in mind, I think uh, that the decision in Lochner can uh, kind of uh, help illustrate how we have gotten to uh, this point uh, as far as government regulation of the economy. And really at the core uh, of AB5, I think, is the same belief uh, that began with the progressive rejection of Lochner uh, and the values that initially made Lochner a well-received case in 1905. Uh, like I said before, the philosophy of free labor, uh, freedom of contract, natural rights, uh, largely rooted in uh, the Constitution in the Article 4 Privileges and Immunities Clause, as well as, to a certain degree, the Ninth Amendment, uh, and to a little-known but highly influential and important 1825 case named Corfield versus Coriel. Uh, and then ultimately in the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, which is actually uh, the provision upon which Lochner was argued and decided. So let me set the scene for you here. Uh, in the late 19th century, most bakeries in New York City operated in tenement house basements, uh, the rent in these homes were low. The cellar floors were sturdy enough to support the weight of an oven, but uh, these cramped spaces, however, had serious sanitation issues. Uh, they were never designed for commercial use, and in 1895, New York enacted uh, the Bake Shop Act, which was meant to address these problems. The law established a detailed code of sanitation standards for bakeries, one provision was added at the behest of the bake shop union, uh, and that was that employees could not work more than 10 hours per day and not more than 60 hours per week. Now, at the time, uh, smaller bake shops were largely owned and operated by Jewish, German, and other immigrants who were largely serving their own communities. Uh, the owners of these businesses fiercely resisted unionization as well as the maximum hours law and their operations required a few employees to operate the ovens over a 24-hour period, and that the workers could then sleep on the premises while the bread was uh, rising or baking. In contrast, large commercial bakeries could employ shift workers to comply with the maximum hours law, and as a result, uh, the Bake Shop Act had the effect of, and was possibly intended to, privilege larger corporate-owned unionized bakeries over their small immigrant com uh, competitors. And this is where a gentleman named Joseph Lochner enters the picture. He was a German immigrant uh, who operated a bakery in Utica, New York. Uh, this was actually a nice shop. It was not in a crowded tenement house basement uh, in Manhattan, as many of them were. Uh, but Lochner had uh, began employing a man there named Armand Schmitter, for more than 60 hours a week. And uh, Schmitter and Lochner had been lifelong friends, uh, and it's believed that they likely reached the arrangement together, uh, particularly so Lochner could be charged with violating the law and thus setting up a test case for the Bake Shop Act. 
And so uh, ultimately, Lochter was convicted of violating the Bake Shop Act. He then refused to pay the $50 fine and was imprisoned. On appeal, he contended that the Bake Shop Act violated the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Now, all nine justices agreed that the Bake Shop Act's health and safety regulations were valid exercises of the state's police power. Both the majority and the dissent upheld the regulations concerning ventilation, ceiling heights, the locations of room, the cleanliness of the bakeries, and all these other similar provisions. Where the justices split, however, uh, and it was a 5-4 split, uh, was on whether the state could enact the maximum hours law pursuant to its police powers. And Justice Peckham wrote the majority opinion in which he was joined by Chief Justice Fuller as well as Justices Brown, Brewer, and McKenna. And uh, essentially the question was asked was, uh, is the maximum hours law a fair, reasonable, and appropriate exercise of the police power of the state or was it an unreasonable, unnecessary, and arbitrary interference with the liberty of contract? And the court uh, would eventually answer that it was the latter. Now, Justice Peckham rejected the claim that the maximum hours provision was a genuine health and safety measure. Lochner's lawyer argued that the uh, mortality rate of English bakers was lower than that of the general population and was about equal to that of cabinet makers, masons, and clerks. Uh, interesting note, this mode of argument uh, that is based uh, largely on empirical data foreshadowed something that would later become to be called Brandeis briefs because they were filed by Louis Brandeis, who uh, was defending progressive legislation. Uh, but the majority opinion uh, in Lochner relied on these statistics. And Justice Peckham concluded that there is no reasonable ground for interfering with the liberty of person or the right of free contract by determining the hours of labor in the occupation of a baker. Indeed, Justice Peckham twice suggested that the New York law was enacted for uh, other motives, which in other words meant the Bake Shop Act was essentially class legislation aimed at helping unions and har uh, harming smaller non-unionized bake shops and their employees. And Justice Harlan wrote the principal dissent uh, in which he was joined by Justices White and Justice Day. Uh, Justice Harlan agreed with the majority that there is a liberty of contract which cannot be violated, but he contended that when the validity of a statute is questioned, the burden of proof, so to speak, is upon those who assert it to be unconstitutional. Uh, Harlan then went on to cite different statistical sources, uh, which undercut Lochner's claim that the regulation was arbitrary. Uh, Harlan thought that Lochner and not the government had the burden of proof to argue the law was unconstitutional. Uh, and this just leaves out one more justice, and this was Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who filed his own now very famous dissent, uh, in which he essentially stated that he would have upheld the Bake Shop Act if any reasonable person could have supported the law. Now, uh, Holmes charged the majority with deciding the case upon an economic theory which a large part of the country did not entertain, namely that of laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, he wrote that the 14th Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. Lochner uh, v. New York was not particularly controversial when it was decided in 1905, except for some critical coverage in union newspapers. Uh, the case was otherwise generally well received in the press. It really only began to be uh, to gain notoriety. Uh, in 1912, when uh, Theodore Roosevelt began attacking uh, Lochner during his campaign speeches for president. Uh, the former president, who had served as a Republican, was now uh, running as a presidential candidate only on his own Progressive Party ticket, and Roosevelt, who had been the gentleman who appointed Holmes to the Supreme Court, was now praising the dissenter's approach in his campaign speeches. 
Ultimately, Roosevelt's third-party campaign took away votes from the Republican candidate, William Howard Taft. And as a result, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was the progressive candidate on the Democratic ticket, got uh, the presidency. Uh, so, in 1916, President Wilson would go on to nominate uh, Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court. Uh, this was the progressive jurist that shared Holmes's constitutional approach. And before and during the New Deal, justice is appointed by progressive uh, presidents, Democrat and Republican alike, would begin to repudiate Lochner. These progressive justices followed the approach from Justice Harlan's dissent uh, that the challenger was the one who had the burden of proof uh, to show that a restriction on liberty was arbitrary or irrational. And after the New Deal, however, uh, notably starting in a case known as Williamson v. Lee Optical from 1955, the Supreme Court would adopt something much more like Holmes' deferential approach. Uh, it seems uh, Obama's caricature of the Lochner case would be wildly at odds with the historical evidence. Now, I think one of the best cases for reconsidering the decision in Lochner uh, comes from George Mason University law professor David E. Bernstein, who wrote a phenomenal book called Rehabilitating Lochner, in which he is drawing on both previous legal scholarship and his own uh, extensive historical research. Uh, Bernstein offers a, a definitive account of this misunderstood and unjustly maligned case. Uh, not only did Lochner represent the victory of the small-scale producer, over large politically connected special interests, uh, Bernstein points out that the ruling read led directly to several of the Supreme Court's most important early decisions in favor of civil rights and civil liberties under the 14th Amendment. Uh, this would include cases uh, like Buchanan v. Worley, which was a landmark case from 1917 in which the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People scored its first victory before the Supreme Court. Now, Lochner's critics also proved ugly, if in a different way, I would say foremost among them, would be Supreme Court Justice Olive Wendell Holmes, who would become a hero to the reform-minded after filing a sharp and much-quoted dissent in the case. And according to Holmes, uh, the proper scope of government power has nothing to do with the protection of individual liberties. Uh, he went so far as to say in his dissent in Lochner, and I quote, the 14th Amendment is perverted. Now, Holmes and his fellow opponents, uh, I would say, seem to have very little use for individual rights, uh, while also believing the police power of the state to be virtually unlimited. But, uh, yeah, so much for siding with the powerless. Anyways, when the justices use Lochner uh, as shorthand for what they consider as activist sins of their opponents, uh, it, I think they are really uh, substituting empty rhetoric for a meaningful constitutional argument, uh, especially considering that to boot uh, their understanding of Lochner always seems to be incredibly inaccurate, but I think maybe perhaps the best reason to give up uh, invoking uh, the mythical Lochner is that it's not particularly effective. I, I seriously doubt any justice has ever uh, contemplated changing their mind because the other side accused them of mimicking Lochner. Well, that is going to do it today. So I hope you enjoyed the show. And uh, what I ask people to do is uh, if you can take a moment and subscribe to the channel, just because I'm not putting videos out on a uh, set schedule right now as I would like to. So if you can subscribe, that helps make sure that you know when new videos come out. Uh, yeah, and then the one other thing I would ask people to do is if you particularly liked this episode today uh that you just take a minute and share it with one other person who you think would also uh like this episode and might enjoy uh you know hearing this uh learning about this stuff uh and if you would do that for me 
I would appreciate it. Feel free to leave me a comment to uh, let me know what you thought, if you loved it or hated it, if you have any questions, if you just want to throw ad hominem attacks at me, I'm, I'm pretty open, whatever. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, as have been categorical uh, imperatives, I have been locking liberal, as always, Delendez Cartago. Thank you.